Dean Evans, and I'm going to be moderating after a fashion and facilitating um, this session of the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, meeting. Um, so the, the way it's going to be structured today is we're going to have a presentation from Adam Romano from Stephen Winter Associates, um, which will kick off in just a second. Uh, and then uh, maybe we'll let a couple more people join in. Um, but after that, um, there'll be some Q&A at the end. If there's pressing questions that you have um, during, um, we can facilitate those as well. Um, Adam has indicated a willingness to, um, to entertain questions that, are, that emerge while he's talking. Um, I think most of you who were on the last couple of these, there's the, uh, the, the attendee section where you can, uh, under questions, you can ask questions, and the way that's done is you raise your hand in the in the in the uh, questions box, and I'll recognize you and unmute you. I think it's easier for us to do them as the peer-to-peer -peer vocally rather than typing them in the chat. Um, so if you have a question that you want to ask, um, raise your hand in the uh, question area, and then I will recognize you then. But if you don't have anything really pressing, then we'll save them until the end, and you can raise your hands as a group. Uh, then and we'll go through the Q and A at the end. So with that, um, I'd like to turn this over to Adam to do a presentation on um, the, the domestic hot water heating and passive housing. Um, Adam has over 17 years experience in the building science field and extensive experience with new and existing buildings. His work at SWA focuses on building performance analysis, conducting energy audits and commissioning, design and implementation of high performance HVAC systems, and instructional design and training delivery. So, um, so we'll be prepared for good instructional design and good training. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Let me Great. Sure I can... Thank, you. Thank you very yep. much. Um, so just to confirm, you should all be able to see my screen. Just want to make sure that's that's correct. Yep. Great. And then um, my web my webcam is starting. Let's see. There it is. All right. So you should all be able to see me as well. Um, so greetings, thank you so much for joining uh, today's session. Um, as Dean mentioned, uh, my name is Adam Romano. Uh, I am a senior uh, building systems consultant with Stephen Winter Associates. I've been with the firm for about two years, um, but I've been in the energy engineering and uh, consulting space um, for 17 years. Um, and I've spent, uh, actually early part of my career, I worked for a contractor, I did a lot of HAC work. Um, so uh, that's really sort of aided in my career, you know, in analyzing systems and uh, looking for improvement opportunities. Um, my involvement in Passive House uh, began in uh, 2010. Um, so it was one of the sort of first adopters of Passive House. Um, there was a small meetup group in New York City uh, where, you know, like-minded folks got together to try to figure out, you know, how, how can we improve building construction? That eventually turned into New York Passive House, which is the membership organization. Um, I was a former board member there uh, for uh, New York Passive House, um, one of the founding members for New Jersey Passive House, um, and uh, still kind of keep my you know, sort of... Uh, Toe in the water uh, with Passive House. Um, I contribute to the Passive House Accelerator, writing articles and delivering presentations. Um, I actually started uh, my sort of journey with Passive House itself is, uh, you know, really training, you know, contractors. Um, we found early on when some of the first projects, you know, were trying to be implemented, there was a need to train contractors because the pricing was coming in very high because they were sort of nervous about this whole concept. And uh, we wanted them to be able to deploy, you know, sort of the air tightness layer and uh, insulation very well. Um, so we spent a lot of time educating them and actually started up the first Passive House tradesperson training facility uh, up in the Bronx back in 2012. Um, so spent a lot of my time in it. I uh, really believe in it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and here is my contact information. So if you have any questions that sort of come up after the presentation, definitely feel free, send me an email, uh, give me a ring. I'm happy to talk uh, about uh, anything that we discussed today or anything sort of Passive House related. Um, before I jump into the presentation, a little bit about SWA. So um, as I mentioned, I work for Stephen Winter Associates. Uh, we provide research, consulting, and advisory services to improve uh, commercial, residential, and multifamily built environments. Uh, and we do this for both you know, public and private se sector clients. Uh, and we specialize in energy, sustainability, and uh, accessibility consulting. Um, we also do a lot of research and uh, development and compliance services as well. Um, and, you know, we really look to sort of achieve best practices and really help to uh, improve the built environment. And we've been doing that since uh, 1972. Stephen has been pretty visionary in that. Um, we have uh, over 125 staff. Um, we have offices in uh, New York City, Washington, D.C., Norwalk, Connecticut, and Boston, Massachusetts. And if you're really interested in what we do, 
um, you know, here's the uh, our our website is uh, sminter.com. There's a lot of great articles and resources on that website, so definitely feel free to explore that. Uh, so, learning objectives. What are we trying to accomplish today? Um, so some of the things that we're going to talk about um, are electric-based solutions. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of why are we talking about electric-based solutions? Why are we talking about electrification? What are some of the drivers behind that? We're going to discuss um, the major considerations when electrifying domestic hot water. What do we need to look for? What kind of systems are available? Um, we're going to be talking a lot about air to water products because that seems to be, you know, sort of uh, a good fit for, you know, our, our, our construction types and, you know, for the access that we have. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the consideration and the best practices when we're trying to electrify DHW. So to start this off, there's been a lot of talk uh, about electrification lately. Um, there's a lot of folks that are interested in, you know, beneficial electrification, strategic electrification. We're really looking for electric-based solutions. And, you know, a lot of the, there's a few drivers that are really kind of pushing us to, to go into this, you know, into this exploration. Uh, you know, one of the, some of the drivers are, you know, from resource drivers, right? So we have, uh, I know here in, in New York State, where I'm from, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the demand for natural gas is outpacing supply on the coldest days. And that has led to gas moratoriums popping up uh, in Westchester. There was one in Brooklyn uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that, you know, our, our reliance on natural gas is becoming higher and higher. And then as the, you know, the, you know, the days are getting colder and colder, you know, we're consuming a lot of natural gas. And that sometimes is outpacing the supply. Um, there's also, you know, policy drivers, you know, here in, in New York State, in New York City, um, we have a lot of sort of policy initiatives to look for um, ways to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, and, you know, one of the sort of the, the highlight, you know, sort of laws that were passed was Local 97, which came out of the Climate Mobilization in, uh, Act. Uh, and the idea behind that, you know, is to really, you know, look at reducing, you know, carbon dioxide emissions uh, in New York City buildings. Um, so there's been this big push uh, for that to happen. And at the same time, on a parallel track, there's been a big push to sort of really, you know, clean up the grid, you know, in, in introduce more renewables into the electricity grid, um, you know, bring on, you know, some low carbon sort of uh, production methods. Uh, and, you know, by doing that, you know, the idea is, you know, if you're going to burn conventional, you know, fuel, you're going to emit CO2. And if you're utilizing this clean electricity, uh, you'll have no CO2 emissions. Um, so bringing those two things together, you know, tapping into that, you know, clean electricity, um, we're going to really help to reduce carbon emissions. So there's, there's that's sort of the drivers that we're seeing to really sort of, you know, go ahead and figure out, you know, what can we do to electrify, you know, our HVAC uh, components. So today we're going to jump into, you know, water heating. And what do we know? So where are we? Where do we stand now? What have we done in the past? And then sort of what what are we looking for as our sort of future facing systems? So typically, what we find, you know, in traditional sort of building construction, we have gas fired equipment. So we're going to have something maybe like this. So you'll find this in sort of a smaller building, or maybe like in a reasonable residential home. It'll be a sort of a direct fired gas water heater. So you have, you know, a volume of water that's being directly heated by a combustion appliance. So you have this burner that's bringing in natural gas. It's combusting that fuel at the bottom. It's increasing the temperature of that tank. That water goes out, let's say, to a mixing valve and then goes out to the building for consumption, right? So it's a pretty sort of straightforward process. It's very familiar, um, very reliable to an, to an extent uh, and, and kind of and works works well. Um, you can you can increase the efficiency of that, you know, and you know that's it's not sort of that you know that gas fired direct fired you know piece of equipment is not super efficient, uh, but you can increase the efficiency of these products by you know, maybe putting in you know a, an option like this where you're using a condensing boiler that's you know pulling all the latent heat energy out of those flue gases and, and you know, operating at you know above 90% efficient uh, C, uh, and then you're injecting heat into a storage tank into an indirect tank. Um, so we can go ahead and make that more efficient. Uh, and in these type of tanks, you may have options to put in maybe, you know, solar thermal preheat, or you can pull some other, you know, sort of uh, heat source in there as well to help preheat those tanks. Um, so these are kind of familiar and kind of what's out there. Now, you want to say, hey, I want to electrify these systems. Well, we have, you know, electric-based solutions that are out there. We have electric-resistive water heaters. They've been around for a long time. Uh, and, you know, they, you know, they work okay. Uh, they're just not terribly efficient, right? So here you have an example of an electric-resistive water heater. It's, you know, it's directly heating this volume of water by utilizing, let's say, two elements here, an upper and lower element. Uh, and those are coming on as the temperature drops and, you know, it's increasing the temperature of that tank. Um, the issue with these is that, again, they're not super efficient, right? You know, you don't have any type of sort of uh, beneficial work taking place. You have, you know, it's purely resistive. You have a kilowatt of energy coming in. You got 3,715 BTUs coming out. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. The coefficient of performance is, is right around one. Um, it's not super efficient. 
yes, it's electric based, then you know it'll tap, it'll tie, you know, sort of tap into that, you know, clean electricity. It's just not an efficient way of doing it. And there's a, there's a smart and a better way of doing that. Um, the smarter way I like to call smart electrification is really looking at, uh, you know, looking at heat pumps, right? We want to electrify, but we want to do it in a smart way. Um, so we're not talking about using electric resistive everywhere. We're talking about, you know, utilizing the most efficient electric driven solutions. Um, so everyone has a heat pump in their house. You know, your refrigerator is a great example of a heat pump, right? You bring in your produce, you bring in your, your goods, you put it into the, into the refrigerator, it absorbs the heat from those components, and then it sort of rejects that heat into your space. So it's effectively heating your kitchen, um, you know, by, you know, removing the heat from those products. Um, and it's done using, you know, electric compressors and valves and components. Um, and you have this refrigerant that's really doing that work. It's a substance that's designed to absorb and reject heat at certain parameters, certain pressures, certain temperatures, you know, based on the application. And that's what's driving that process. And by doing that, you know, it's much more efficient than a electric resistive, you know, element, right? Because now we're actually taking in, uh, you know, more components and we have, you know, it's actually additional heat that can be generated, uh, you know, based on, you know, the input coming in. So our coefficients of performance can be, you know, two, three, four, five, um, you know, using this refrigerant based system. And how it works is pretty, pretty, you know, it's simple, you know, as sort of a, a high level explanation, pretty much what you're going to have is an area where you're going to have, you know, a source and a sink, you're going to absorb heat, right? So, you know, have an evaporator here, this is where the refrigerant is uh, absorbing heat, and that can happen, you know, anywhere you want it to be. It could be an outside, you know, unit, it could be, you know, inside of your refrigerator, it's an area where we want to go ahead and absorb heat. So we're going to use this evaporator to do that. Right, refrigerant comes in, it's coming in as you know a liquid, it's going to turn into a gas, and that latent heat uh, absorption you know, has a big refrigeration effect, and we can cool off you know, certain things. So we're taking that, uh, that refrigerant that's absorbed all that heat, we're bringing it into a compressor, the compressor is gonna compress that refrigerant, it's gonna raise the temperature, it's gonna raise the pressure, uh, and we're going to be able to now go ahead and reject heat to the sink, uh, which could be, you know, sort of, you know, uh, your house, your kitchen. It could be, uh, you know, the volume of water in a domestic, you know, uh, water water heater. Um, it could be anywhere you want to sort of reject that heat to. Then the refrigerant is going to give up the heat, condense back into a liquid, and then the process is going to start again after it goes through the expansion device to break down the, uh, the pressure. Uh, but by doing this and by moving this heat, you know, we're not really generating it. So that's kind of the, the limit when you have with like fossil fuel based systems, right? Or delivered fuel based systems. You know, you're using, you, you can only, you can never get 100% energy, you know, sort of efficiency out of those because, you know, you're combusting something, there's going to be byproducts, you're going to have to get rid of those byproducts. And by getting rid of the byproducts, you're getting rid of the heat, some of the heat energy. So they're never going to be 100% efficient. Here, we can achieve efficiencies greater than 100% because we're not generating heat, we're just moving heat around. Uh, and we're also absorbing additional heat from the compressor because we need to cool down the windings and you know the electrical components of that motor. Um, so that helps us you know get even higher efficiency uh, than 100%. So we're seeing you know two, 300, 400% efficiency uh, with these types of systems. So you know, that's when we talk about smart electrification. We kind of want we want to use these refrigerant-based systems to achieve that performance. Now you have to pay attention to the refrigerants. So one of the things that you know is sort of the really one of the factors that drives performance and drives efficiency of these systems is the refrigerants that are used. And there's a lot of different refrigerants that are out there. Um, and you know most common refrigerants that we're going to see in our types of heat pumps we're going to talk about today are R410A, R134A, um, and there's some limitations to those refrigerants when it comes to low ambient operation. Um, so we're going to talk about and explore some of the considerations there. The other thing is. Refrigerants themselves are greenhouse gases. So you really have to pay attention to this. If we're gonna move towards you know, electric-based, you know, refrigerant-based solutions as our way to reduce carbon, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we can't you know, sort of have these you know, greenhouse gases, these refrigerants being vented into the atmosphere because that's going to cause you know, an adverse you know, sort of uh, effect, right? Uh, we're gonna you know, undo all the savings that we're trying to achieve because the refrigerants themselves, if you think about it, when they're designed, they're designed to be chemically stable, they're designed to absorb and reject heat. Um, so that's a, you know, it's a great greenhouse gas, right? When it's, if it's, when it's vented into the atmosphere unintentionally, let's say through leaks, uh, it goes into the atmosphere, it lasts a long time because it's, you know, it's chemically stable. Uh, and it also acts as a great greenhouse gas because it's been designed to absorb heat. Um, so you look at, you know, these global warming potential uh, sort of uh, listings here, you can see some of the refrigerants that we're talking about, 410A, 134A, have, you know, global warming potentials, you know, thousands of times higher than carbon dioxide. Um, and, you know, that's a big issue. So when we re-electrify and we use these systems, 
we need to do it responsibly. We have to train uh, our contractors. We need to make sure they understand the implications of leaks. And we need to make sure the systems are commissioned uh, and working well. So that's one thing we really have to pay attention to as we go through this. So let's talk a little bit about solutions. So some of the future facing systems, some of the refrigerant based systems that we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, integrated heat pump water heaters. These are available, they're out there. You know, they uh, have good penetration in the residential market. Um, here you're using a, um, an integrated unit. So what we mean by that is that the refrigeration cycle, the process in the entire process is integrated within this tank. Um, so there's a volume of water and there's a refrigeration component above that. So you have, you know, your tank here, you have your refrigeration circuit, and it's all in one package, all in one appliance. So what happens here is you bring room air in that's, you know, that has heat energy in it. Uh, it's going across an evaporator coil. You're absorbing that heat energy. You're cooling off that air. So you're discharging cool, dry air into the space. The heat that you absorb goes through the compressor, uh, raises temperature and pressure, and then that heat is now distributed or, you know, uh, discharged into this uh, volume of water. The water gets heated up and then that water goes out to a mixing valve and goes out to the building. Uh, and then the refrigerant comes back to absorb more heat. So this is an integrated uh, system. You can also split them up. So um, there are also split uh, type systems where you have an outdoor unit that houses the entire refrigeration circuit. And then you have uh, plumbing connections where you're bringing cold water from a storage tank to get heated up uh, at this outdoor unit and then discharge into the storage tank uh, to keep that tank nice and warm. So there's ways of sort of splitting it up if you don't want to integrate it. And we'll talk as we go through about the considerations, like, you know, when you're sort of uh, deploying uh, integrated units versus, you know, uh, split units, what are some of the considerations there? But these are the two systems that we're going to kind of talk about uh, for, for today. Now, when where do you start? How do you, how do, you do this, right? So where we start is just like if you're looking at a passive house, right? Um, and you know, what, one of the things that makes passive house different is that you know, you're scrutinizing the enclosure. You're looking at you know, air tightness, you're looking at thermal insulation, you're looking at thermal bridging, you're looking at high performance windows and doors. You're, you're trying to make the load as low as possible so that you can put in the smallest, you know, most adequate uh, piece of you know, mechanical equipment to condition that space. You got to do the same thing for your domestic hot water consumption, right? Because, you know, what we want to start is that same principle, that same foundation is saying, hey, we need to reduce flows. We need to make sure that, you know, we are not putting in, you know, huge fixtures that are, you know, consuming a lot of water because that's going to drive up the size of our unit. That's going to drive up the energy consumption for our domestic, um, domestic hot water appliances. So we want to look at, you know, ways to go ahead and reduce those flows. So we want to use engineered fixtures that are low flow that, you know, have, you know, flow rates of, you know, a gallon per minute. And sinks, you know, a gallon and a half per minute at showers and kitchen sinks, uh, and really get those flows under control. You want to do the same thing with your piping. You want to make sure that the piping that's being distributed throughout the building that's going to supply hot water to the building is, you know, is sized correctly. You don't want it to be too large. You don't want it to be, you know, sort of uh, indirectly moving through the building in all these different areas. You want it to be direct as possible. You want it to be insulated. Um, all those, you know, sort of things have to happen first, right? We have to have good plumbing practices before we get into, you know, uh, talking about systems. Once you do all that, um, then you have this decide, okay, well, what kind of system do I want? Uh, do I want it to be central where I'm using, you know, one big plant or, or maybe more big plants, two plants or so uh, to heat, you know, water for many people? Or do I want to do a decentralized approach where now I'm going to heat water in multiple locations? Um, so maybe it's, you know, per apartment, you know, in a storage closet or it could be as, you know, as a sort of distributed as, uh, you know, under a sink, you know, uh, point of use of appliance. We have to make that this determination, you know, where do we want to actually, how do we want to heat this water? Uh, once, if you decide that you want to do the central uh, type uh, heating, then you have a couple of options, right? So here you're talking about large scale, sort of commercial grade, you know, modular, you know, engineered solutions, uh, and they're out there. There's not a ton of market penetration in the U.S. right now, uh, but there are pockets where you're starting to see these systems, you know, uh, getting uh, sent out uh, and getting recommended in, in projects. Um, they're great. Um, they're, you know, widely used in Asia and Europe. Uh, and in the U.S., you see them in, in these commercial uh, and uh, industrial applications, but you're starting to see them uh, come into more multifamily applications. The big limitation with these um, is the refrigerant, right, and the operating characteristics. So we're in a cold climate. 
right? We, we're not in the South, we're not in you know, the West Coast, you know, we have to deal with very cold days, right? And we have to make sure that our systems are going to work on those cold days. Um, and you have to look at, you know, the refrigerants uh, and the operating conditions. Again, we talked about, you know, how refrigerants impact, you know, performance. Uh, you can see that, you know, some of these refrigerants that are being used are for 10A. Um, you know, you have issues where the, as the ambient temperature gets lower and lower and lower, it becomes harder and harder and harder for that refrigerant to generate that kind of lift, to pull heat out of very cold air outside and then discharge it into a volume of water to produce you know, hot water for the building. As that, those temperatures start to you know, deviate and start to become greater, it becomes much harder for this you know, appliance to, to do that. Uh, and you start to see reductions, right? This is one of the units that you know, we just showcased. Uh, this is the engineering data from that piece of equipment and you can see as you know the uh, the air air temperature gets lower and lower outside the efficiency drops so you sort of see a 36% efficiency drop in colder temperatures because again as it becomes colder outside it becomes harder and harder and harder to harvest heat from that air and that's not you know just these units it's it's universal to all heat pumps that are going to be split you know as the temperature gets colder outside you're going to have it's going to be it's going to take more energy to uh, to harvest that heat uh, but here you see a pretty dramatic, you know, drop in uh, in efficiency. It's a 36% drop. That's going to impact, you know, your energy costs. It's going to cost more to operate that unit at low ambient temperatures, uh, and it's going to impact your savings. You're not going to have a ton of savings if the unit is operating in very cold conditions for long periods of time. The bigger thing is it's going to impact capacity. You see a 38% capacity drop in colder temperatures as well. So what that means is that now I have to put in a very big unit um, that can, you know, oh, it's going to be oversized for the majority of the, of the year, but it needs to be big enough that it can go ahead and uh, serve the domestic hot water load when it's, you know, 10 degrees outside. Um, and I'm sizing for that. So that's going to impact sizing, you know, of the equipment or what you do is you put in additional storage. So the other option is to say, okay, either I'm going to put in a big piece of equipment that can handle, you know, the domestic hot water load at very low temperatures, or I'm going to put in a ton of storage uh, to be able to draw off of that, that, so that the building can draw off of that storage, and then, you know, replenish those tanks, you know, slowly over the course of a few hours, right? Um, that, that impacts, you know, first cost, that impacts, you know, operating cost, um, you know, so we have to, you know, take that into consideration. Um, so that's one of the big things we have with this. We have some solutions and we'll talk about that towards the end, uh, but that is something you have to understand when we're sizing these systems. It's not like our old systems where it's like, hey, you know, I have a, a boiler that's going to produce 100,000 BTUs and I'm going to use that to go ahead and produce domestic, you know, regardless of the temperature outside, you know, that's the nameplate rating, right? That's what it's producing. Um, here you have to look at, you know, what is the, you know, the production in terms of, you know, capacity, you know, at the temperatures that, you know, we're going to see uh, in our cold climates, because you are going to have that drop off. So what if you don't want to deal with, you know, the outside temperature impacts? Uh, you want to use something like an integrated heat pump water here. This is going to be located and sited inside, right? So what can we, we do here? So you can see, you know, these are in a closet or these could be in a mechanical room, uh, but it's, it's not as, you know, it's not impacted as much uh, from, the, um, from the outside air. So there's some efficiencies to that. Now, the big thing that, you know, sort of affects efficiencies with this unit uh, is, is two things. Um, so one thing I want to highlight before I jump into the next screen is there is a thermostatic element here, right? Um, this uh, electrical element does come on at certain points in time. So the heat pump has a safety built in where, you know, the integrated uh, heat pump water heater is going to use the heat pump as much as it can. Uh, but in times when, you know, the demand is high or the temperature is low, that element's going to kick on. And when the element kicks on, you know, again, we're getting, you know, we're not taking advantage of that refrigeration effect. We're not getting those higher COPs. So our overall performance starts to drop in terms of efficiency because as we rely on the element to replenish the tank, replenish the heat so we can produce hot water for the, for the building. So two things that really impact that are um, hot water use. So the draw profile. So how much uh, concentrated draws do I have? And what I mean by that is, you know, when someone wakes up in the morning and they take a shower, you know, if they're taking a 20 or 30 minute shower and you're using a lot of water right at that period of time, um, that's going to have a in big impact on, on efficiency in terms of this uh, integrated heat pump water heater. So this comes back to the conversation of making sure we're using, you know, good engineered fixtures, low flow devices, things like that, because we're trying, it's very hard to break habits, uh, but where we can sort of, you know, go ahead and impact this is by making the fixtures, you know, as efficient as possible. But you can see here in this graph on the left, what this is showing is a uh, integrated heat pump water 
water heater, it's showing the energy consumption. So it's talking about how much you know energy we're using in the, the green here is the heat pump, the red is the electric resistive, and uh, the blue is the hot water uh, draw. So on this axis here, you can see how many gallons are being consumed at that point in time. And then here you can see how much energy is used in watt hours. So you can see when the draws go up, you know, this heat integrated water heater can pretty much, you know, sort of handle a 15 gallon draw, things like that. Uh, but once that gets higher and you start to see 20, 25 gallons uh, draws, um, then you start to see, you know, the more of that electric uh, resistive element is coming on. So that you're generating that electric resistive element, we're kicking that on, that's producing, you know, that's producing hot water to compensate for the heat pump. And by doing that, you can see where you're consuming a lot more energy. The heat pump down here, if it's just, you know, sort of, uh, running, you know, without that electric resistive element, it's, you know, it's sub, you know, 200 watt hours. But as soon as we kick that electric resistive element in, we start to see, you know, a thousand watt hours, 1500 watt hours, you know, we're starting to, you know, impact performance and our COPs are going to go down when you have those concentrated draws. So we have to pay attention to those. The other thing that's going to impact uh, efficiency is going to be the ambient temperature. So the temperature at which the, uh, of the surrounding air in, in that room, so wherever that heat pump is sited, you know, the temperature in that space is going to have an impact, again, on, on, on efficiency uh, and on how much we're going to rely on that electric resistive element to produce hot water. Um, so you can see here the ambient temperature, you know, is in blue. We have our uh, heat pump energy in red, and then our lower element is the electrical resistive element coming on. And you can see when the temperature drops, you know, in that space, you know, below 46 degrees, we're starting to use more of that lower element. Again, we're starting to use much more energy, and that's reducing our coefficient of performance. So with these types of units, how do you fix this? How do you make this work? So contrary to sort of, you know, popular belief or, you know, or, or, you know, sort of what you would think um, with these types of water heaters, uh, if you're going to use those, um, you know, increasing the set point can help uh, and increasing the size of the tank can help. Um, so let's talk about that. So the set point temperature, you know, making the, the heat pump produce hotter water um, will help with minimizing the electric resistive element coming on. It'll, it'll reduce the runtime. Uh, and the reason why that happens is, you know, here you're going to utilize a mixing valve. So that mixing valve is piped here at the outlet. So what the mixing valve does, it brings cold water in, uh, it takes hot water from the tank, it blends those two together, and it produces safe water for the building, right? So if you increase the temperature of the tank, let's say we you know your tank is typically at 140, we increase it to 160. So what happens is, as I have a draw off of that tank, if I have someone calling for hot water, I'm setting out 160 from the tank, I'm sending, bringing in 55 degrees from the city, more cold water is going to be blended in to produce that 120 than if I had 140 degrees coming from that tank, right? So that's going to help us, you know, limit the amount of water drawing off of that tank because I'm blending more cold water in to, you know, to go ahead and serve that load as opposed to pulling that 160 off the tank. So that's kind of one way of doing it is like saying, oh, let's, let's increase the temperature. That'll help reduce the reliance on that lower element because, you know, the heat pump can replenish that tank over the course of X amount of hours. And then when those concentrated draws come in, you're pulling more cold water uh, than you typically would. <clears throat> the other thing you could do is uh, increase the volume. So if I increase the volume of the tank, if I was, you know, let's say a 40 gallon tank was adequate, maybe I go to a 50 or an 80 gallon tank. Uh, and what will happen there is that now I have a bigger reservoir. So I have a bigger battery that I can pull off of when those concentrated draws take place, uh, and I can go ahead and uh, utilize that uh, instead of, you know, sort of running, and the heat pump and then can replenish that tank over a longer period of time. It doesn't have to replenish it very quickly. So that'll reduce the amount of electric resistive energy we're bringing on. So in this case, you know, bigger is better and hotter is better. And again, it's counterintuitive, uh, but that's, you know, sort of what happens with these types of tanks. Um, the other thing you have to pay attention to is the space requirement. So in order for us to not reduce the ambient temperature so much, we need to have enough, you know, waste heat to be able to pull from. Um, so we need the room to be big enough so we have enough airflow. Um, we also need enough, you know, sort of waste heat in that space to be able to, to keep the temperature, you know, uh, you know, above, you know, a certain point. Right. So that's one of the things we have to pay attention to. We have to put them in rooms uh, that where, you know, it's not going to get, you know, uh, too cold in there because the volume of the space is, is very, very, uh, very, very small. The other thing you got to pay attention to with these is noise, right? It's an integrated heat pump water heater, right? It's located, it's maybe located in the living space. Um, and you have a compressor there. Compressors are going to make noise, you know, as much, you know, sort of, you know, um, you know, advancements we've seen in compressors and variable speed and vibration isolation, it's still a compressor. Um, and, you know, it's not, you know, 
super loud, but it's it's you know it's louder than a refrigerator and it's quieter than a vacuum. So, and, but if it's running long periods of time, it kind of goes and drones on. So it's about 55 decibels. Um, so you have to pay attention to like where that's going to go. If you're going to have a mechanical closet in an apartment uh, and it's going to have transfer grills to allow airflow in and out, if that's next to a living space, you know, um, which it more most commonly will be, uh, that could be you know you know too loud for the for the residents there, and they may go in and you know and adjust the heat pump water heater. There's a way to turn it the heat pump portion off and just keep it as electric resistive and then you're not going to see the, the savings you're not going to see the performance there uh, because of it and you know and when it's also located close to you know those living spaces you have comfort concerns right because you know the byproduct of this unit running is that it's going to cool and dehumidify that air um, so you're going to have cold air discharging from that unit and again if there's transfer grills and it's located you know close to a you know a living space you may have these drafts that may, may uh, sort of uh, be established uh, and that may you know make the residents feel uncomfortable uh, because of the cold air coming out uh, especially when you have higher draws um, so we have to pay attention to that uh, and the last thing, you know, with these is they're going to produce condensate. You know, uh, part of it is, you know, cooling off that air, dehumidifying that air, moisture is going to be produced. Uh, that's going to have to get, you know, sort of pumped somewhere. We have to discharge and then get rid of that. Um, so we have to make sure we have, you know, condensate management uh, practices. We have drain, uh, pans in case the pumps fail so that we don't have damage to interior surfaces. Um, that's all going to take place uh, if, you know, to really sort of properly, you know, sort of implement these types of, of, of water heaters. And then there also is a maintenance component to this as well, right? So, you know, the, you know, the filters are going to need to be changed. When anytime you do sort of a, a decentralized approach, you know, the maintenance burner becomes higher because now you have many pieces of equipment that need to be serviced over the expanse of the building. Um, so you have, you know, filter change outs, you know, coil cleaning, things like that does, do need to take place in order for these units to, to work well and to, and to perform uh, for, their, uh, for their rated lifetime. You can scale them up. So we've seen, you know, sort of uh, instances where these have been scaled up to serve larger loads. So instead of, you know, having these as a decentralized approach and putting them in each one of the apartments, you can sort of centralize them into a, uh, you know, mechanical room and then uh, gang them together. So here you can see the smaller building, uh, a multifamily building where they built out a mechanical space uh, and they created this central plant by manifolding these systems together. Uh, the tanks were in the ba basement, so that protected you know, the residents from noise and comfort and things like that. The problem here is that you know, this space didn't have a lot of internal loads or a lot of internal gains in that space. So in terms of sourcing heat for these, you know, integrated heat pump water heaters to work, it quickly sort of, you know, depleted the heat in that space and the temperature started to drop. And, you know, what happened is these units started to go off on error because uh, the temperature was getting really, really cold. Um, and what happened in this particular case, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not really great, um, is that the room would get colder and colder and colder. And then, you know, we would start producing less heat for the tenants or domestic hot water for the tenants uh, that the management came in and actually put in electric resistive heaters in the space to bring the temperature up. Right, so the heat pumps wouldn't go off on air. Um, so that's not you know, a great solution. That's not a great approach uh, to doing this. Um, so you have to make sure if you are going to use these types of systems that you know the ha space has a lot of you know internal gains where you can harvest. Um, you, you keep the intakes away from each other, so you want to make sure you're not blowing cold air into the you know the in inlet of the the uh, next unit. Um, and you want to make sure that you know you size this correctly. So there are ways of scaling it up, but those are some of the you know the things you would want to avoid. Let's say you didn't want to use these integrated heat pump water heaters. Maybe you wanted to go and split it out, right? Uh, and the benefits of splitting, you know, these systems up is, you know, again, you get rid of the, the noise issues, the comfort issues, you know, all that because now the refrigeration device is located outside. Uh, but you do have to you worry about the capacity drops and the efficiency drops, right? Uh, and there are some systems, again, that, you know, we talked about earlier um, that, you know, were based on, you know, using refrigerant 410A or 134A that had really big capacity drops as the ambient temperature, you know, fell. There are some systems, however, that it can work well at low ambient temperatures, and this is one of them. So this, instead of using 410A or 134A as the refrigerant, this unit actually uses carbon dioxide as the refrigerant. Um, so now it provides higher discharge temperatures at you know, lower ambient outside temperatures. The only issue with these is that there's very few options uh, available in, in the US, um, and you know, there's you know, some tricks to scale these up. They're really meant for residential sort of applications, you know, smaller scale, uh, 
homes or you know or one to one sort of units there is a way to scale them up and we'll talk about it um, but what's nice about these is that you know they have the ability to work very efficiently uh, at very low ambient temperatures so you can see the graph here um, that's showing um, capacity is in blue um, and then uh, you see that we have very you know, zero capacity loss down to five degrees ambient. Uh, and then you can see the coefficient of performance here is fairly high down to very, very low outside temperatures. Um, so even at you know, 10 degrees, you're still two and a half, three on the COP side, as opposed to the other unit, which was hovering above one. Um, so you still have, you know, you have very, very good coefficients of performance. You have zero capacity loss down to five degrees. Um, it's just that, you know, you have to scale these up to make them work for multifamily. Much, they're much, much more efficient than integrated uh, tanks. You can see this is a, a data set, you know, from looking at weekly COPs versus outside air temperature. And this shows the CO2 unit versus the integrated heat pump water heater. Uh, and you can see CO, you know, the COPs are very, very high, even down to, you know, seven degrees or so. You're still seeing, you know, very high COPs uh, with, with the with the Sandin unit versus the, the Ream unit, uh, which is now down sub one because of the electric utilization uh, that we're seeing with the electric resistant heat. Um, so these, you know, these units can work really, really well. What's interesting about them, and you'll see here, like the liters per day, is the draw po profile. These units actually work very, very well when there's high draw. So counter to what you see with, you know, the integrated water heaters where the concentrated draws are coming in, these units actually perform better when there's concentrated draws. And the reason being is that they love to have a big delta T. So the CO2 refrigeration cycle really loves to have that big lift. So it wants the coldest water to come in and it wants to discharge, you know, 140, 160 degree water outside. That's where that particular, you know, sort of refrigerant works well. Um, so you can see this was a report done by Oak Ridge National Laboratory and you can see the in inlet water temperature and you can see the COP here. So as that inlet water temperature starts to drop, you start to come down from 80 to 70 to 60. We're bringing colder and colder and colder water back to that heat pump. It, the efficiency is going up, 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 up and up. Right. So we're seeing now COPs of four and a half when the inlet water temperature is at 60 degrees. So this type of unit, you have to pipe a little bit differently. Right. So what we don't want in a multifamily application is, you know, typically what we see in multifamily is we'll have a recirculation pump and that'll blend the tanks and it'll send water out to the building and it'll come back. We don't want that to happen in this type of um, this type of unit. We want stratification to take place inside the tank. We want the cold, dense water to sink and we want the hot, you know, sort of less dense water to sit at the top. And we want to pull from that cold, dense water at the bottom and bring that to our unit uh, to make sure that we're increasing the, the COPs and we're working at, at the highest efficiency possible. Um, so that's kind of counterintuitive and, you know, and really kind of bodes well for, you know, areas where you have, you know, high draw. The other thing you worry about these is that you do have to cite them outside. So that's one of the things you have to overcome is, you know, we have to pay attention to max vertical distance and horizontal distance. We have to make sure that the, you know, the, the plumbing connections, the water lines that are going out to this unit are short and direct, right? We don't want those to freeze during uh, cold outside temperatures. So we want to insulate them. We may have to put heat trace uh, on those pipes to, to make sure that we're not going to see uh, those pipes uh, freeze uh, during uh, really, really cold uh, stretches. Um, so that's one of the things you have to pay attention with these because you're running plumbing connections to the outside, not refrigerant lines. Um, the other thing you got to pay attention to is defrost. These units are going to go into defrost, right? So as that cold, you know, outside coil is harvesting heat from the outside air, it's got to be colder than, you know, the outside air to do that, right? And if there's any moisture in that outside air, it's going to freeze on that coil when it gets down below 32 degrees. So you have to have, you know, the ability to raise these up to allow for defrost cycles to take place to make sure that we can melt off of that, that ice um, before it becomes a hazard. You also have to make sure that we have the unit high enough um, if you have an area where you're going to see snow and you may have snow drifts, right? You know, we want to make sure these units are not getting covered in snow. Um, so those have to be sort of taken into account as well. So you can maybe put them on a wall bracket, get them high off the ground um, to protect them from that and shield them from, uh, from those conditions and while allowing the condensate to, to drain out. Um, and then you know, the last thing we'll talk about before we drop for a QA, and a I know we went through this quickly, um, is that this is a case study of how you can scale these up. Um, so here, you know, we have a particular multifamily building in uh, New York City. 
uh, where we've sort of deployed these sand-in units, uh, these small CO2-based units, uh, together in a parallel configuration uh, where we're now we're increasing the output capacity uh, to serve 100% of the domestic hot water load for this 50-unit uh, uh, building. Um, so there's 14 of these units that are up on the roof. Uh, they're piped together in parallel. They go down through a riser uh, to a pump set. It's hydraulically separated down there. Uh, and then that heat energy goes into storage tanks. And then those storage tanks, you know, are what's serving the load in the building. As those tanks deplete that, that hot water, these units kick in and they slowly recover, uh, you know, the energy from, uh, and recover the energy and put, you know, put hot water back into those tanks. Um, but that's the one thing you have to pay attention with these is that the recovery rate is much less than a gas appliance, right? You have a very fast recovery rate for a, you know, a gas-fired appliance because you're generating a lot of heat very quickly. Here, it's kind of a low and slow approach, right? So we need to build in enough storage to make sure that we can weather those draws and then slowly replenish, replenish those tanks over you know, uh, an hour or two hours, three hours, uh, and get them up to, up to speed. So you need a little bit more buffer capacity there. Uh, but this unit is uh, being commissioned right now, uh, this system, um, so we'll get some data coming out of this you know probably you know a year from now um, but the idea is to, to really you know sort of take advantage of this and you can see this unit this building has a solar array um, so any type of excess production you know during the summertime boom goes into these units we can store that heat energy like a thermal battery uh, downstairs uh, in, in the storage tanks um, so it's a really great sort of application there perfect um, so again, here's my contact information. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, we can break for questions. Um, and uh, but here's my contact information again, if you would like uh, to discuss, you know, further you know, after this presentation. Uh, terrific, Adam. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you uh, very well. Okay, good. This is Dean. You'll see me in a minute, but I'm shy, so I'll turn my webcam on in a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's time to open it up for questions, everybody. Um, we have one that was written into the question section, um, and, and I will ask it now. But for the rest of you, if you want to raise your hands, um, uh, I will uh, unmute you, and you can ask your questions directly at, under the attendee list. You can raise your hand, and OK, I've got a couple already. So first, uh, let's go to Greg Leskin, or Leskin, I don't know which. Um, but his question is on the COP versus OAT graph for the Sandine just a second, I better be able to scroll this down. For the sand for the Sandin versus the Ream, um, conversation only the peer-to-peer -peer network could have. The COP versus OAT and the Sandin versus the Ream. Um, do the Ream values take into account the COP of the heat source used to provide to heat the building, to provide heat to the building space? Do you want me to repeat that, Adam? No, no, I, I understand. No, so this is um, this is purely the. Uh, it's not showing the the heat uh, coming from the, from that building. So uh, that's one thing that will impact this. So you, yeah, you're absolutely right. So to get the true COP from this, it actually it's going to be a little bit lower because now you have to run your mechanical system to produce heat in the space to have that waste heat uh, to be for the for this unit to be able to go ahead and harvest that. Um, so you're absolutely right. The you know the COPs will be a little bit lower if you're looking at it from a total sort of building wide you know sort of input. Um, there's going to be more input there uh, from that. Terrific. Okay. And uh, uh, Greg, if you want to have any follow up questions on that, just uh, raise your hand uh, under the attendee. Uh, next, it's um, uh, Karen Patrick. Um, I will unmute you. And Oh, this is done by the organizer. Rudy, I think you're going to have to unmute Karen because I've not come in as the organizer. Can you do that? Yeah, I've unmuted Karen. Um, Unless you're muted. You have to unmute I, yourself on your end too. Sort of a double. Hello? Yep, there you yep, go. There you are. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Uh, we're working on a small commercial passive house. Um, existing building. We're thinking of putting the the hot water, the sorry, the water heater in the unconditioned basement. The basement is outside of the building envelope. Is that a good place for that? I thought we were thinking it was a good idea, and, and after hearing you, we're wondering if that is a good idea. Yeah. So the thing is, we, you, you're going to need to have um, you know some waste heat there. So if it's in an unconditioned section of the the basement, now depending on what type of unit. So which which unit are you thinking of installing there? Is it sort of an integrated, or is it going to be sort of um, like a, the CO2 based systems? 
That's a good question. Someone else on the call hopefully can answer that for me. Ah, here, Jeanette said integrated. Right. So the integrated is the integrated tanks. You know, they're going to be impacted by the the temperature there. So um, if that space is not large enough to handle the volume, and if there's not a lot of internal loads, then that's you know, especially when the draws take place and you have you know concentrated draws, and those tanks are really you know the heat pumps are, are really screaming to kind of recover. Um, the temperature there is going to drop. Um, and it's going to be, you're going to see a higher utilization of that electric resistive heat uh, just because, you know, that as the temperature drops, you're going to have uh, the, the lower COPs there. Um, so, you know, in some passive house projects, you know, we see, you know, this, we've seen, you know, a, a tendency for overheating to take place in certain times. You know, there's less of a, you know, a swing and AC kind of, you know, um, becomes the more dominant load over time. So I would, you know, see if there's ways that you can sort of integrate that uh, into trying to pull some of the waste heat out, out of the building. If there's ways to sort of yeah. um, condition it um, and try to, you know, get rid of some of that waste heat yeah. um, that's being generated and take the burden off of your mechanical system. Okay, I'm actually thinking, sorry, I'm thinking the opposite, where we have one small heater in quite a large basement we're actually worried about now uh, in the winter, it being okay. too cold. As long as the space is large enough, because again, that's the thing, like, you know, you're going to have to make sure that that space can, re can recoup the heat, right? So it can regenerate heat in there so that you can harvest from it. Um, so if there is enough, you know, sort of, you know, thermal transmission there um, and there is, the space will get, you know, uh, you know, warmer at some point. Um, then it shouldn't be as much of an impact, but, um, but that's oh. something to, to pay attention to, just to be aware of. Is that, yeah, is that, is that if that space is small and uh, it's not large enough, you're going to see those temperatures plummet, um, and you'll have a bunch of issues with operational sort of uh, performance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Karen. Um, I noticed that uh, Greg had a follow-up question, and then we've got a couple more lined up. So maybe Greg, I'll unmute you, and you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah. Sure, thanks Adam for the presentation. This is just going back to the COP versus the outdoor air temperature graph and I just wondered if you had any resources or saw any good papers available on um, kind of fixing the ream COP to account for space heating uh, COP in there and the reason I ask that is because I know that PHPP has uh, plugins that try to work through this. Wolfie Passive has a similar thing, and there just doesn't seem to be a wonderful solution yet. And I wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, you know, um, I haven't. Um, this was done by Oak Ridge um, National Labs. Um, I could, I can look and see. I can talk to our, you know, our, our team and see if they have any research. Yeah, that's the one thing that's limiting by this. It's a little bit, you know, misleading. Um, is that you know it's not taking into the in the entire, you know, sort of scenario and an account. It's just purely looking at temperature versus COP. Um, but it's not looking at as an integrated approach uh, in, in a building um, but I'll look and see if we can find anything and I can I can send uh, any anything that I find uh, over to um, the, uh, to Dean and, and others to, to distribute okay thanks thanks Adam and I'll maybe I'll drop you a line too sure absolutely uh, yeah, definitely feel free to reach out uh, thanks Adam thanks Greg uh, Steve Hall has a question I'll unmute you and you can unmute yourself Steve okay yeah I think I'm good can you hear me Yep. Uh, I'm just wondering, in, in general, I'm kind of uh, acting as an advisor to, to uh, real estate developers. What are the relative first cost of these solutions? Uh, is there any anything you can really say about that? You know, we don't have a ton of good data yet. I mean, we're the, you know, the, the system that we're looking to sort of in, in, uh, set up and we're commissioning now, you know, this, uh, this oops, sorry, this unit here. Um, you know, we're just getting some information in and, you know, obviously there's that the first cost is always going to be high on the first few projects because, you know, the contractors, you know, have this, you know, sort of, you know, risk, you know, they're trying to avoid and, you know, the costs do go up. Um, but uh, I can I can send some data around and see what our first costs look like here. Um, but obviously we expect those first costs to come down as we start to get best practices put together. We have training that's going to take place uh, to educate the contractors um, and just anything that's new is, is always going to cost a little bit more. Uh, and then it'll tend to, to drop down as, as more people feel comfortable with the approach. Um, and we're also looking to see like, 
you know, larger units come into um, in, into play here. Um, so we would like to see, you know, sort of larger capacity units as opposed to these are only 15 MBH. Um, so they're not relatively large. So we have to, you know, gang a bunch of them together in a parallel configuration to serve load. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we're going to, as we start to show more demand, you know, in the U.S., um, we can see some, some larger units come online uh, and that'll help with, you know, the first cost reduction. But um, whatever information I can find, you know, again, I'll, I'll distribute and definitely feel free to, to drop me a line as well. Um, and I could uh, see what information we have. Um, well, you, it's the best representation of it. Were, were you speaking of CO2 uh, units? C, these are the CO2 based units, right? So yeah, these okay. are the ones. Good. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of where we're, we're, we're you know, kind of looking at as you know the future is you know just because you know the you know the other ones the traditional 410A and 134A systems you know they I, you know former colleagues I've worked with have deployed them very very successfully out in California uh, and other areas where you know the ambient temperature doesn't drop that low they they work well uh, in those applications um, you know I've, we've seen them you know installed in parking garages you know and things like that where you can go ahead and, and uh, utilize that waste heat you know from uh, from the engine blocks um, but but uh, when you get out here and it gets cold, you know, um, you know, you really need something that's going to be CO2 based in order for it to really work successfully. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, I don't see any other questions here, but I know Kathy has one. You want to jump in, Kathy? Sure. Yeah. So if, first of all, thank you, Adam. This is really good. And like most presentations that are really good, I have more questions now than when I started. Um, but I'm working on a project, it's a townhouse project, and we've spec'd the sand in <laughs> units. Um, and currently we've spec'd a unit for each unit. And I'm wondering, based on what you said, if it would make more sense to spec a larger unit for two units, you know, to be able to, you know, hopefully balance that better. Um, and then also we've, you know, located the uh you know the split unit outside and i'm wondering understanding that there may be condensate issues if we should think about putting it in the attic instead well, I mean, we have done, um, so we've, I have a couple other case studies that are, that we've cited these indoors um, to help out with um, some waste, waste heat that's being produced. And it's kind of a more like a New York City, you know, sort of unique thing where we've put them in like um, in certain parts of the city, you know, that's served by Con Ed's district steam. Those steam rooms get really hot and they're hot year round. Um, so there's a lot of waste heat there, even though the, the building's not consuming steam. Uh, and, you know, so we're pulling that waste heat off of the pressure reducing valves and things like that. Uh, to, to produce domestic or to preheat the domestic. Um, but uh, you can site them indoors. Uh, that, that does happen. It just You just need a, a good amount of airflow. You need to make sure you can meet the airflow requirements. Uh, and then you'll get some beneficial you know, conditioning from that. So you can get you know, sort of unique in, in the approach. Um, the condensate, you know, it, it, it's going to run in defrost, right? So uh, you know, it's not like um, there'll be any freeze issues you know, with that condensate. So it's just like a traditional you know, uh, HVAC you know, heat pump. Um, it's going to turn back and you know, it's going to reverse itself. It's going to make the evaporator the condensate. It's going to heat it up, uh, and then it's going to melt that off, and it'll it'll drain out. Um, it's just, uh, and you know, there's designed to drain outside. Uh, and, and to do that. So um, I don't think there's any issues with siting it outside. Um, the attic may be a little bit more problematic, but um, but I think um, in terms of pipe routing and things like that, uh, I don't think there's any issues in sizing it, out, siting it outdoors. Um, in terms of the, the, the units, it depends on how the cost structure is going to work, right? So like if if you had you know, units sharing, you know, the electric, you know, service, where how does that you know, work out when you when you come to, to billing and things like that? Um, and uh, but I think a one to one can work successfully as well. You're still going to have to put in, uh, you know, probably two units to serve, you know, that those 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 banks of two. Uh, you'll have just have a larger storage tank, so you'll be able to cut down on some of the storage. Um, but um, but you know, the, the first cost is probably still going to be pretty similar. So if you were doing a project in Connecticut, um, yeah. and it, again townhouse, you mm -hmm. would do individual units and split the unit and put the the, it outside yeah. is that what i hear you say that would, that would be the approach that would be the approach that i would take yes thank you mm -hmm. great kathy thanks uh, we've got a couple more questions coming in first charles whedon i'll unmute you and if you unmute yourself you can ask your question you're still self-muted charles i you need to unmute yourself 
There you go. Can't hear you, but it looks like you're unmuted. Uh, okay, Charles, one more chance. <laughs> Looks like you're good to go, but uh, can't hear you. Okay, uh, maybe Charles, you can come back in a minute. Anthony Law, um, I'll unmute you. And uh, if you can unmute yourself, there you go. You look like you're open. You want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. I, I, um, this is actually following up kind of to that townhouse question and to Karen's question earlier. She's planning a, a passive house with the with an integrated unit in the in the basement uh the the unconditioned basement um i have a an older inefficient house uh and i'm thinking in a semi-conditioned basement uh meaning closed damp in the summer um but you know probably close to a thousand square feet of uh of space i would have thought the integrated would be a good would sort of be appropriate for a, to replace an old gas water heater. Um, yeah, you, you can. One, thing, one, one advantage I'm also thinking is uh, getting rid of my dehumidifier. Yeah, so we, we've seen we've seen that happen, you know, and it works well in those spaces. You know, if you have the ability to go ahead and get some beneficial dehumidification, again, it's not it's going to run when the demand is there, right? So it may not it's not going to run as continuous as a dehumidifier, right? So it's only going to run when the tank needs to be you know replenished. Um, so you may not get as much dehumidification from that unit as you would with a constantly running dehumidifier. Um, but if you have you know waste heat in that space, you know it will definitely you know work uh, to your advantage to be able to pull some of that that heat energy from from there um, as long as it's not you know and a thousand square feet is kind of the minimum so that's kind of what they want to see for most manufacturers is at least a thousand square feet of free area there um, that you can you can pull from uh, and, and discharge to now there is the ability you know if you're worried about the space temperatures getting too cold um, and you do have these units outside there is a way to duck them um, to the outdoors uh, or to bring air in from the outside so there is ducting uh, you know sort of uh, uh, abilities as well um, if you're worried about that space getting too cold, there's a way of just discharging that air on the outside. You just have to worry about the, you know, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, you would uh, depressurize um, that space when, when that unit is running. Um, so right. that may be the only sort of, you know, um, issue there is that if it is fairly tight, um, there'll be some, um, you know, depressurization taking place. And if you have any atmospheric appliances, you'd have to weigh that out and make sure that um, they're working appropriately. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, it looks like Rebecca, I'm going to mangle your name, but Ansola Beheri uh, has a question. I'll unmute you and then you can jump in. Okay, can you, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Great. Um, my question is about that last um, Kate study where you had mm -hmm. the aggregated sand in units. Um, I think you mentioned that there's uh, limited pipe runs you can have on, the, on those units, and I was wondering if this project ran into that and you know how they got around it getting down to that yeah so the, so the way that worked was um so the you, the pump there so inside each, each one of these units there is is a small circulator here that moves water uh from the unit to the the tank typically um and uh since our runs are fairly large uh, 50, 50, uh, was it 40 50 feet uh to get to the top of the building we actually um worked with sandin uh, and talked to them and we actually hydraulically separated um, the flows. Um, so if you, so what's happening here is that the sand and units are only pumping to um, the bulkhead because uh, we're using the bulkhead as a way to, to get the, the risers down. So really all that those pumps are moving water with the pump, the pumps themselves there is just circulating water to that bulkhead. And then off of that bulkhead, we're using closely spaced T's uh, to act as a hydraulic separator. And then we have a larger pump down in the basement that's sized to pump the water up. Um, so we're, we're separating those loops uh, hydraulically so that the pumps, the head pressure that those pumps are seeing on the sand ends is minimal. It's just, you know, circulating it around. Uh, and then the larger pump set in the basement is doing the, you know, the larger, um, the larger lift. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see if I've got any more here. Um, anybody else coming in? Uh, I don't see, uh, I don't know, Charles, I can try you one more time, um, although I don't think he may be here any longer. Um, yes. 
Oh, there okay. you are. Now? There you go. It's there you go. Okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, no. that, I can hear somebody. I don't know if that's Charles. Oh. Okay. I hear you saying somebody saying okay. <laughs> if that's you, you can talk. All right. Um, anybody else out there? I have a couple of final questions, but I'm not seeing anybody's hands raised. Um, last chance. Um, in the interim, if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you. But um, I, I just wanted to ask Adam one or two questions. When you were talking earlier about the equipment and the, the sophistication of the equipment, because we've been running into this issue a bit with the peer-to-peer, -peer. the more sophisticated the equipment, the more, in principle, sophisticated the maintenance and operations can become. And so I saw you had to educate uh, either owner or tenant or both in one of your slides. How's that going? I mean, uh, you know, it's, you hear it all the time about we need educated <laughs> owners, operators, but are they getting educated and understanding how to do this? Um, or is it still sort of an ongoing liability? You know, it's, you know, it, it, when, especially when something is, you know, in early stages, there's a little bit more, you know, more, more handholding uh, and, and the education does take place as you start to scale this, then, you know, you're relying on contractors to then become, you know, the, the educators to, to the end users. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are some maintenance tasks. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's definitely different than what you're typically used to, right? So if you look at like, uh, you know, a traditional water heater that's in the basement, no one <laughs> pays it any mind, right? It just sits there. The only mm -hmm. time you're really concerned with it is when it leaks. Um, uh, and it just goes along and hums along for, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be. Uh, with these, you do have to have, you know, those the filter replacements and you have to pay attention a little bit more, making sure the condensate pumps are working. It's nothing too different than what you know a regular service contractor would do um, but it does need to be pointed out and you know i think it's a little bit early to you know, see how that education is going because a lot of the projects have been sort of working in tandem with consultants that have provided that education um, but i think it's really you know a benefit to as in designers and, and architects and engineers to, to have that in the spec um, projects you're working with is that you know the contractor is responsible for for end user education and there needs to be some sort of you know packet put together um, and with the maintenance requirements uh, or the operational staff for that matter uh, need to be trained on these systems um, because again like you said you know the uh, the technology is is advancing um, the the you know the the other units the split units um, you know there's some coil cleaning that has to take place and I, I would imagine that would happen from the contractor's perspective they would come out just like you would for a, a regular heat pump maintenance you would go mm -hmm. in and maintain that clean the coils um, there is a lot more in there in terms of just like any other heat pump right there's a lot of you know circuitry there's you know um, you know DC diodes and bridges and all that stuff in there um, and you know the contractor base you know does need to be you know educated and the manufacturers are stepping up uh, I know we're working with um, with Sandin uh, to be able to produce some training for them for their contractor base uh, to get them up, up to speed uh, but the maintenance requirements um, you know uh, are not too much different than what you know your typical HVAC contractor would do Gotcha. Okay. And then tied to that, when you're using um, or introducing relatively new technologies like the ones you were talking about a little bit here in the CO2, um, do the manufacturers and the installs, are there specialized warranties for getting out in front of the market on some of these things? Um, or are they the standard warranties or how do you, you know, who negotiates what with respect to that? Yeah, the, the warranties are pretty standard from my experience. Um, you know, I think the um, the nice thing about uh, these units, the ones that we're talking about today, um, there's no field fabrication of that refrigerant circuit. So that takes a lot of the, you know, sort of the potential for issues that, or the risk, you know, uh, mm -hmm. out of the question because it's being produced, you know, uh, offsite uh, and quality controlled in a factory. Uh, and then it's being shipped over and, you know, and pretty much you're just make, making plumbing connections, uh, which you know the plumbing industry has been doing for hundreds of years um so it, you know the warranties you know are pretty standard with that because there's it's less mm -hmm. and, and it should work well because there's less there's more quality control uh and there's less you know a guesswork you know like um one of the things that we see with a lot of risk is you know the variable refrigerant flow systems going out into buildings because you have hundreds of thousands of joints that have to be field fabricated and then trying to discover those and fix those you know after mm -hmm. you know post construction post occupancy uh becomes very 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 difficult um, 
Um, so, you know, this is a much sort of, you know, um, safer solution or less risky solution uh, to deploying a refrigerator-based system. Terrific. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, that was my last question. Now, Charles has his phone unmuted. Um, Charles, you want to take one last shot at Adam? Can you hear me now? We can. Yes. All right. Finally. Um, <laughs> Adam, I've been, I've built or worked with a number of single family on slab on grade homes where I can't use an integrated unit. Um, and I've recently heard about a solar assisted hot water unit, a BMTB, that's just being imported. I think it's a 410A um, unit, but I didn't know if you'd heard about that. I was trying to look for a, an alternative to a, you know, just putting a marathon in these homes. Sure. Yeah. No. I, I I'll look into it and see. I, I haven't heard about it directly. Maybe some of my colleagues have. Um, but um, yeah, I think you know solar thermal. You know, could have its place in, in a way to be able to solar assist. You know, if there's a way to sort of preheat the water through some sort of collector. I'm not sure how it actually it works. They, uh, they use a collector on the roof that's that the refrigerant flows through. Oh, so you're actually heating, you're absorbing heat oh, from the, oh, gotcha. So it's not the water that's being preheated. You're actually right. absorbing radiant yeah. energy from the, okay, makes sense. So it, um, it's not the yeah. sand in where you have to worry about um, freezing. Sure. Yeah. So that, that, that's interesting. It's an interesting approach. I mean, you just, uh, it's a matter of how much energy it can, uh, it can collect when the, the solar radiation is more diffuse instead of direct. Right. Um, so if it could still collect, you know, uh, if you have to say a high you know, amount of cloudy days, you know, when it's cold, right, you have a tendency, you know, for some storms to come through, what would happen there? It can, and it absorb diffuse radiation as opposed to direct radiation uh, well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it could be interesting. Uh, it also picks up some of the waste heat from the, from the roof structure. Um, so yeah, I'll, I could look into it. If you, if you, I have, you have my contact information is here. So, yeah, send it I'll over. Send you, I'll send you their flyer. I'll send you the information. Good. Great, thank you. Terrific, thanks, Charles. Glad we got that all worked out. Um, and uh, I think that's it for the questions. So um, I hope everybody joins me in, in raising their hand, clapping their hand, doing whatever um, for Adam. I thought that was a great talk and generated a lot of interest with everybody. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and now um, we have a few minutes in our normally allocated time to take a look at 